I'm going to go ahead and get started for time's sake. Um, please know that this is a very casual meeting. I am not going to go into the entire alphabet. <laughs> and I'm just only going to go over briefly the history of Unshul. And um, I will show you some tips and tricks having to do with your parallel pen and also um, how to create guidelines easily without having to print them. And the last thing I'd like to go over is a couple of letter forms. So I'll go over the letter form I and the letter form O. And then I'll open it up to questions um, towards the end. We'll probably have about 10, five to 10 minutes for questions, okay? So let's get started. Um, Welcome to Unchul. Um, as you know, Unchul falls, uh, Unchul is a very large umbrella. Um, you're going to find a lot of different forms of Unchuls out there. Even within just the name Unchul, you're going to find many variations of the way it is taught and shown, um, either by teachers or through books. Um, and then from Unchuls, you're going to have artificial Unchuls, and then you're going to have all of the Roman Unchuls and Italian Unchuls, and then you have the half Unchuls, and, and then it just goes from there. Um, but today we're going to be focusing specifically on just Unchuls. Um, I also wanted to go over the history of Unchuls. I think that is really important as you're learning, taking the time to learn a script or a hand, that you understand where it comes from. And it really makes a lot of sense as, as you learn the history of it. So I have here one of my favorite books um, on my shelves. It's by Patricia Lovett. So let's go ahead and um, spotlight my um, desk here. So Patricia Lovett has many, many books, and this one is called Calligraphy and Illumination. And I originally got this book because I was interested in illumination work, which is um, gilding and painting, um, especially with minerals. And this is a history and a practical guidebook. Um, I got a library copy of it. There are many copies out there. Um, and I have here starting a picture of, yes, dear. Second, I'm having problem spotlighting. Yeah. Okay, and I can do it from my end as well if you'd like me to try. Right. Why don't I go ahead and do that? Yeah. So let me do that. Okay. Good. Is that better? Everybody see? Yep. Yeah. And if everyone, um, if you look on the bottom, you will see reactions. Um, you can go ahead and click on reactions and you can give um, a thumbs up or a wave if Takako asks a question to the entire group and you just want to give her a quick response so she knows. Okay, so here's the book one more time. Patricia Lovett. The book is called Calligraphy and Illumination. Um, this is a library copy that I found for $5, which is amazing. Um, and I wanted to open up to here, um, starting off with the Roman capitals. We're going to go way, way back to about the first, and first century or so. So we're going way back in time. Now, it's really important to note that back then, majuscules, which are uppercase letters, and minuscules, which are lowercase letters, were in existence. However, both were not um, standardized together. So usually it was one or the other. Um, and a lot of times, unchuls are claimed to have um, come from the Roman capitals, which is true in a way, um, because Roman capitals came before what we call the uh, rustic capitals. But before rustic capitals, she doesn't have the square capitals in here. Square capitals came first and then the rustic. So let me explain what that means. Um, square capitals uh, were, are basically very straight lines and angular forms. And because of those straight and angular forms, um, square capitals really lent well to the carving into stone. Um, and then what happened is that particular script where it was very difficult to write on papyrus with a pen. And so therefore this script, which is the rustic letter forms, came into play. Um, so just going back in time, you're going to have to understand that Christianity was spreading throughout Europe. And the Christians decided that they did not want to share the same script as pagans did, which was the rustic form, letter forms right here. So then Unchul 
was created, which is then the third majuscule script of that time, aside from the Roman capitals. Exporting papyrus from Egypt to Europe uh, was starting to become really difficult at about this time, political and economic factors, you know. So therefore, parchment became one of the real reasons why unshul was used, because the roundness of the unshul script, let me turn the page, which is here, the roundness of the unshul script really played well with the smoothness of the parchment paper. Um, it's really also important to remember that Greek was a language um, of the church in Europe at this time. So early forms of the Latin unshul script was really heavily influenced by Greek unshul. So again, when you see unshul forms out there, you're going to see different, different uh, forms, letter forms within each unshul exemplars, exemplars that are out there. So some are going to be heavily influenced by Latin unshul script and others might be influenced by the Greek unshul scripts. Um, so therefore, I think of unshul as kind of like a transitional script. Um, it has the characteristics of both minuscules and majuscules, or majuscules and minuscules. So originally created as a third majuscule script, you'll start seeing minuscule letters um, starting to form, even though it's considered a majuscule script. All right. So from there, uh, you know, more informal everyday sort of letter forms um, started becoming um, in demand, so to say. So there, then for, therefore, um, the half unshul script came in, and we're moving into about fifth century. So we quickly moved through uh, second, third, fourth century, and fourth century is probably where is where the most um, earliest documented form of unshul is kept, um, which is the Augustinus. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this up. And the other thing to remember about um, Anshul is the actual name Ansha. So the word Ansha literally means a very specific dimension, which back then was one twelfth of a foot. So Anshul equals inch. All right. I'm going to go ahead and show you the parallel pen. Um, I'm going to pull out all the parallel pens that I have because some of you might get a set and some of you might get just one or two. Um, I'm going to put them in order of how I use them, like that. So if you look at the caps, the caps will tell you the size of each of these, whoops, here I am, pens. Okay, uh, I might not be in focus, sorry about that. So today I'm going to be using the 6.0. The 6.0 and the 3.8 are the two that I recommend starting with. And um, as you get more confident with your letter forms um, and you get to really know each stroke, then I would suggest the 2.4 and 1.5 is getting really small. So I'm going to go ahead and work with this today. So if you have the parallel pen, I'm going to uncap it real quick. What's really cool about these is that they require a refill, or you can just dip and write, right? You've seen some people do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncap this one as well. So if you have a parallel pen, go ahead and uncap it. And I'm going to go ahead and do this. Here's my refill. I'm not gonna uncap this one because I actually don't have a refill in this one. And today I'm gonna to show you how easy it is to use your favorite ink with your parallel pen. All right, what you're going to need is a dropper. So if you have a dropper, go grab one, just this one right here. And you're going to want your favorite ink to refill with. So I like using the walnut ink because um, what I like to do is take walnut ink and it's so versatile, I like to dip it in, the tip of my pen in with another, you know, uh, coordinating color. For example, this is the Midori Sour by Fox and Quills. And I would dip the tip in Midori Sour and write until the walnut ink starts coming out. And then the green blends into the brown, which makes a really beautiful kind of autumn red color as a transition. 
and then transition then into walnut ink. So you can do little tricks like that. But walnut ink is great. I also love using my fountain pen inks. So if you have a collection of fountain pen inks like I do, um, this is a great way to utilize your fountain pen inks. All right. So go ahead and take out your favorite ink that you would like to put into um, your pen. And yes, Sumi ink also uh, works quite well in fountain pens or in the parallel pens. I got ink all over me, so let me just wipe that off. <clears throat> all right, so what we're going to do is if you have a refill attached to your nib here, um, the top of your parallel pen, you're just going to hold it upright so you don't have any leakage. You're going to take your pen, your, your refill, you're gonna give it a little twist and pull very gentle kind of twisting and pulling motion until it comes off, all right? And keep your, uh, make sure that you keep this kind of like an angle so that whatever ink is on the inside doesn't come out. Set this aside. Take your dropper and uh, set this aside as well. I'm gonna use a pen rest real quick. Just, oh, maybe not, I'll leave it flat. I'm gonna take my ink, uh, my dropper, put it into my ink, fill it up. Take the reservoir, which is the bottom half of your parallel pen. You're going to put your dropper inside there. Gently squeeze the ink in. And what I do is usually fill it up at about maybe a third of the way. So I would fill it up to maybe about here. And I would give it maybe about a my uh, digit from my finger, finger top to my next knuckle, about that much space of ink. And then you're going to take your pen top, cap it on, and then just gently give it a good last twist so you know that it is on there well. Okay. And then you're ready to write. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this aside and um, Hold on one minute, get my other parallel pen out. Make sure I clean up as I go so I don't have any accidents. They didn't call me whoops daisy for nothing back in the day. And if you remember me from several years ago, that actually used to be my Instagram name, whoopsie daisy Jane. All right. So I want to move on to the broad edge nib real quick before we get to guidelines, making guidelines. So here I have, I'm gonna get a piece of white paper here too, so that you can see better. I have a speed ball, C nib. I have a browse 180 nib which is this one right here. And I have a Mitchell. Okay. I'm gonna zoom in. Okay. So the reason why I brought these out is I'm going to give you a terminology or two that you will recognize. Um, the terminologies are oblique and straight. So even in the broad edge nib world, we have those words oblique and straight. In this case, it refers to the cut of your nibs here. So the speed ball and the browse 180 nib um, are what we call an oblique cut. So if you look really closely at the tip, they are cut at a slight angle. And then if you look at the Mitchell nib here, the Mitchell nib is what we call a straight cut nib because tip of the nib, the, the edge of the nib, is a straight cut going straight across, no angle. Um, beginners are recommended that they start with a, a, an oblique cut nib because what this allows is an even distribution um, when the nib contacts the paper because more often than not, most of your broad edge scripts will require a slant angle. It is not something that you are um, unable to achieve with Mitchell. You're perfectly capable of doing broad edge calligraphy um, like the Unshow with a Mitchell nib. However, when you're first starting out to eliminate frustration, um, I highly recommend the angled nib. The difference between these two nibs 
is that the speedball nib has a very, very slight rounded tips on the corners. Um, and um, it, because of the rounded tips, I personally have found that as I get smaller in sizes on the speedball C nibs, um, I get, um, I be become happy. I become, I start having a more difficult time getting a very thin hairline coming out of my strokes, going in and coming out of each stroke. So my go-to for getting those really nice um, contrast between the thick and the thin lines is the Browse 180 nib. Of course, there are other nibs out there um, that are available, but these are the three that I happen to use the most often. So I just wanted to share that little tidbit of information. All right, so I'm going to set that aside. I'm not going to use those today, um, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood that there is a uh, difference um, between those three. Okay, so going back to the parallel pen, again, before guidelines, I forgot one more thing regarding the parallel pen, is um, sharpening. And I'm going to bring out a few other pen, another pen that I like to use, which is the automatic pen. So the automatic pen is similar to the uh, three that I just showed you in that they actually have a reservoir, whereas the parallel pen, the reservoir is this actual barrel of the barrel of the um, pen where the ink goes directly into the nib automatically. The automatic pen has a slit, and if you very carefully um, pull the end here, you can see that it splits apart and that is where the ink comes out and the reservoir is obviously this diamond shaped part of this. And I really do love this because um, it has a very smooth um, touch to the paper and they have a scratched, like a indented etched side and a smooth side. It doesn't matter which side you use. Um, I obviously have a preference for the smooth side because if you, I don't know if you can tell, but one side is canted ever so slightly because of the pressure that I put on it, like so. So if I were to write like this, it's actually, um, the, the other side is relatively flat to the paper. So I use the smoother side. Now, scratchiness is um, something that a lot of people um, probably do not prefer to have on their nibs. Um, my nibs tend to get really scratchy because one of my favorite papers to use is the rough watercolor paper um, or rag paper. And so they tend to uh, cause my nibs to dull and it does two things. Um, one, it catches on the paper more and two, the ink doesn't flow quite as well. So I wanted to give you a little quick tip on how to remedy that. So here I have a, um, the sandpaper here and it's 600 gray. 600 is the number you're looking for. And it is so um, almost, it is not as rough to do any damage to your paper or to your nib, um, but just enough to be able to create a, a good smooth um, edge to your nibs. So we're not going to really grind into it. What I like to do is get a running, if you're using the parallel pen, I like to get a running start. So I get some ink on there. Um, let me go ahead and show you real quick hard to see. There's some ink on there. And I get the ink going because I need a wet surface to do this on. Okay, so you're going to get the ink on there, puddling on there. Uh, can you see? I'm going the opposite way there. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the edge of your nib and you're going to very gently drag it towards you like that. Just a few times, turn it over and very gently do it to the other side. Okay. And if you wanna finish it off, you can hold it upright and just do one or two across the top, very, very gently. And what that does is allows a very smooth stroke and the ink starts flowing very nicely. Same with the automatic pen. Because the automatic pen doesn't have ink coming out, you're going to want to put some water or ink on here. Oops, I'm off the screen. So go one, two, three, and then do the other side. And then if you want to the top, just do a couple of times on top. And then you'll get a really nice smooth glide across the paper. 
So that is a little trick to have. So again, that number is 600. You can get that on Amazon in huge quantities. Okay. okay. Yes, Takako. We have one question regarding to fill, refilling the ink. With yes. To the parallel pen. Yeah. Uh, question was, can you just fill the cartilage? The cartilage is not refillable. Okay, that's unless you uh, yes, unless you get a refillable cartridge. Let me see if I can find one. one. Um, where did I put my box? Oh, well, my box is in here. Um, I can post a picture of it um, on Instagram. Uh, for I can actually go over that. So tomorrow is my supply Sunday, um, and I do that at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So if you'd like to come on Instagram tomorrow at 11 a.m., um, I will. I can go ahead and go over this one more time and show you uh, what a refillable cartridge from Pilot looks like and how to refill your pen um, using the refillable cartridges. Is that okay? Yeah. And then okay. just one quick question regarding the sandpaper. Yes. yes. When you shape in the top, pull in one direction or back and forth? Okay, so it's not a scrubbing motion. You're not going to scrub into the paper. Um, I'm going to use the automatic pen because it's, it's um, larger and easier to see. I simply just drag it to one side a couple of times. So that's one, two, three. I flip it over. I do the other side. One, two, three, and then maybe I'll just do a couple of times one, two on top. So it's just ever so slight, very gentle. I'm not really pushing into it. I'm just allowing the nib to just kind of glide across the top a few times. And that's it. All right. Gentle. Be gentle with your supplies. <laughs> okay. And I hope that helped. All right. Are we all doing okay? All right, so um, let's go ahead and go over guidelines since we have now put ink in our parallel pen and um, you are ready to start writing. All right, so I don't know how many of you know what a T-square ruler is. I'm going to go ahead and pull this off real quick. It is this thing here. Okay, so a T-square ruler has a T-shape lip on one side. Usually it is raised and it has a ruler that extends out of it. And what this allows you to do is this lip allows you to sit on the edge of something like let's say my, hold on, it's hard to see. So let me pull this off real quick. This lip here allows your ruler to be able to sit at the edge of something raised. So I'm using my leather pad here. And my leather pad has a, um, a slight thickness to it. And so this ruler allows it to sit on here and glide up and down. And I have a straight edge, all right? So what I'm going to show you is how to utilize something like that to be able to quickly make your guidelines, all right? So what you need to do now is get a scratch piece of paper. And this scratch piece of paper is about maybe two and a half inches long and about an inch wide. And you're going to take your, and don't worry about the exact size because you're going to end up trimming this. So just approximate is fine. And what you're going to do is, for fun's sake, I'm gonna show you what it looks like to dip and write. So I have my walnut ink in here and I have my Midori Sour. I'm just gonna dip into my Midori Sour and you're gonna turn your paper so that it is, the, the long side is upright and the short goes across, okay? And on the corner, we're gonna do what we call pen nib widths. Now it's called nib widths or pen widths and because it goes nib widths or pen nibs, I just call it pen, nibs, pen, pen nib widths, PNWs. And, in, and to be able to create that, and I'll explain to you why in a minute, um, you're going to simply take your parallel pen or your nib and you're going to create a rectangle up on top and it looks like this just go across like so and that there I'm going to zoom in is one p n 
W, pen nib with, or you can do pen with or nib with. So that's one right there. Okay. Um, then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create what we call a ladder, right? So you're going to create another one right next to there that goes right directly on to the side here. Okay, you can do this and drag down if you want, but you're going to miss, if you do that, you're going to miss your one, the nib width being exactly that. All right, so if you're tempted to do this and drag down, um, avoid that because then you're doing the pen nib width the other way using this side of the paper. So make sure you go this way towards the end of the paper. And again, create another one. If it makes it easier for you to see where you're going, you can do that and then drag across to create your one pen and nib width. Okay, and then you can do this if you'd like, so you know where to line up, and then go across. So for unshul, I created four, because for unshul, we do four pen nib widths. Okay, and do me a favor, at the bottom one here, just have a line that goes across and stop. All right. This is gonna make sense in just a second. So now what you're going to do is you can, if you have scissors, grab your scissors, and you're going to simply trim down the length so that you have this, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to add tape to the bottom of that. Take your T ruler, slide your guide, this is going to be your guide, underneath, line it up right there at the end, like so. Pull the tape under and stick it on there. All right. So now what you have is a guide for lining your paper. I'm gonna zoom out now so I can show you my paper. Let me grab one real quick. Okay. So as far as paper is concerned, you can use any paper that will tolerate the, um, the ink that you want to use. Um, I love using my Gilbert Bond 25% um, cotton paper that you can get at John Neal Booksellers. So that's what I'm using today. Now to make your guidelines, um, you want to go as long as you can. Now you can go short ways. So if I do it this way, you can see how short my paper is going to be. But I want to get the most out of this paper when I line. So I'm going to go landscape instead of portrait. Okay, and what's going to happen is I'm going to put this tea ruler up against my leather pad, like so, so that it can slide up and down. Okay, I'm going to put my paper up against the tea ruler, like so, and I'm going to start a line first. So, using a pencil or a pen, I'm just going to go across like that, get a start, and pull down line this guide that I have here up against the top. Good so far. Okay, then I'm going to run my pencil like that. Pull down, pull across, pull down, pull across, and so on and so forth. And you have your guidelines. Very easy. Um, the next question I'm sure that's going to come up is what happens when you have the ascender and descender lines. So with Unshul, your pen nib width is four pen nib widths for the X height. I'm going to demonstrate that here. I'm going to put the guide the line ruler away. Okay. So to make your pen nib widths, there's two ways you can do it. You can do what we call a ladder, which is just that, like so. Or you can do the stairs, which is just like climbing up the stairs. Okay. 
whichever one you prefer. I always um, tend to use the, uh, the latter more because obviously it takes up far less space. It only takes up this much space, whereas the ladder takes up, or the stairs takes up this much space, but whichever one is easier for you. Okay. Um, the A sender and D sender in Unshul, depending on the exemplar that you use, it's really important that you remember that, is anywhere between one pen nib width to two pen nib widths. Okay. Um, I tend to teach at the one pen nib width because my Unshul um, is probably an exemplar that comes uh, more from the start of Unchul and not towards the end of Unchul. Um, you, you'll start seeing that transition come going from one pen nib width to close to two pen nib widths because of, um, for example, the letter D. Um, the Unchul that I teach with the A sender uh, coming down into to round out the top of the D um, is closer to one pen nib width whereas um, another more modernized unshul may have uh, start more closer to the two pen nib width ascender line and then swoop in um, gracefully coming down in and out and over. So we're gonna do four for now. Now for those of you who are asking, well, how do I line taking into account the um, extra pen nib width? There's two things you can do. You can take account of it while you're lining. So as you're lining, what you're going to do is here you have lined uh, four pen niblets, right? So you can go up one or you can go down one, sorry. Go down one, in my case, one pen niblets. And that would be right there. Okay. And then you're going to just go across like so. And then you can do the four. Now, if you want extra spacing, you can go ahead and generate an extra line here, and that would be your space spacing, okay? Then you would have to then remember that you did that so that you have an A sender, X height, and then D sender and then spacing, extra spacing. So what that is, is here's your X height, okay? And then you have your A sender, you have your D sender, and you have space. All right. Takako, do we have any questions regarding guidelines right now? Not for regarding the guidelines. I have a question about cleaning the name. So one question came up that um, this person's C name, it got clogged by Sumi ink or acrylic. How would you clean that? Uh, did you say gouache? No, acrylic. Or oh, Sumi. acrylic. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, acrylic is uh, not a good idea. Um, you want water-based inks. Yeah. So yeah. my advice from my experience was for Sumi ink, you um, put small amount of water in the dish and then soak it in there for 10, 15 minutes and wash it off. Or acrylic painting, you probably might want to soak it in the hot water. That you might hot water. Mm -hmm. Or the, the, you can get the um, uh, cleaners for acrylics. Um, you know, like uh, if you paint with acrylics, you can get an acrylic cleaner for your paintbrushes. <clears throat> that helps take acrylic off and you can put it in there. Now, I'm going to say a warning with that, what, that one. I have never tried that before. And two, um, <clears throat> your, your parallel pen nibs are not going to be as fragile as, let's say, a fountain pen pen. Right, so <clears throat> the type of material that you put into those, um, the fountain pens, they say be very careful about the acid acidity of anything that you put in because it has the possibility to corrode either the nib or the mechanism inside your fountain pen. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say the same probably applies to your parallel pens. Um, just be really careful about the type of acidity that you use. So uh, do your research and look into um, 
how to do that. And in the meantime, within the next 24 hours, I will look into that as well. And I will um, try to remember to address that. Um, acrylic uh, clogging of parallel pens using something other than water-based inks um, during Supply Sunday. Okay. All right. Oh, and I should also explain why I draw my own guidelines. I have a printer at home. That printer and I have a love-hate relationship. Okay, I love to hate it. I really do. So I use it as little as possible. And as much as I appreciate the time and effort that my instructors and mentors have put into creating guidelines that I can print, um, the time that it takes for me to coax my printer to come to life and even print anything resembling uh, guidelines um, is probably not worth it. So I just, um, I do this. And this technique of drawing guidelines, it comes not from me, it is not original. Other teachers teach it. And the most recent teacher to teach it to me was Carol, Carol Dubosh. So um, she teaches it during most of her broad edge calligraphy courses as well. So if you've seen this happen before, um, that's the reason. If you do want to print it, there are lots of guideline um, uh, printables out there. And uh, my dear friend Lan over on Instagram, I think it's uh, lan.qs. Takako, you, you probably know it, or maybe someone can type it in. Oh, I see it coming up. Who is that? Did Dindy do that? Hi, Dindy. Thank you. Yeah. So what Dindy did, um, go ahead and go to that link. And that link is amazing because she has created guidelines, not just for broad edge calligraphy, but for copper plate and Spencerian. And also if you go to the right hand side, there's a pull down menu. And if you pull down, she even has the guidelines for Suzanne Cunningham and um, other instructors out there and guidelines required by IAMPETH. So if you're not a member of IAMPETH, um, that is a guild that calligraphers belong to. Uh, an international guild, and those guidelines are also on there. So go ahead and do all those. And, and you can also create your own guidelines on there if you'd like to. So that's it in a nutshell, the reason why I take the time to create my own guidelines, the love-hate relationship. I love to hate my, my, my printer. All right, slant lines is the next thing we need to address really quickly. And I need to do this fast because we need to go into the I and the O. So um, we have here, um, the slant line is going to be, again, very different for every exemplar that you come across and every teacher that teaches Unchul. So um, you have anywhere between zero degrees to 30 degrees. And yes, I did say zero because historically there are Unchul exemplars out there that use zero degree pen angle. Um, it's a very beautiful look to it. Um, but today I'm going to teach it at 30 degrees, the steepest that most unchills will go. Um, most teachers will probably teach it at about 20 or 25. I personally like the look of 30 and the exemplar that I have studied from um, in the past tends to be more closer to 30 than not. So I just go to 30. Now you can use one of these doohickeys to do a slant line. And what you do is uh, you just mark a center and you find your 30. And then you just line it up and you have your 30 degree slant line. Oops, I'm a little off there. So that's 30. And then write 30. I was thinking, for those of you who don't have one of these handy dandy tools, how can you find 30? So uh, this is where Rob and I came to heads last night. I was explaining to him my brilliant aha moment of finding 30 degrees. And he's like, you know what? That doesn't work because it doesn't make any sense. He's a very mathematical kind of person. So I'm going to show you his way first so I can say that I showed you his way first. And then I'm going to show you my ingenious way of getting 30. So he, his was very um, mathematical. So you're going to create a 90 degree angle. And I'm going to get a ruler with lining on it. <clears throat> with lines on it. Yes, dear. You are at the 15 minutes mark to the okay. point. All right. Thank you so much. And remind me at 10 then. This shouldn't take 10, uh, five minutes, but hopefully. Um, I will do that real fast. So you're going to mark off really fast an inch here. And you're going to go an inch here. And then you're going to connect that like so. And then what you're going to do is you're going to divide this into thirds. 
So I'm gonna, he's going to, he's gonna hate that I said this. I'm going to do it roughly. So here's about a third. So if I were to do a third here, and let's see, come in a third here, more or less, and here and here, and you divide that, you're going to go a third. Okay, so for those of you who are really mathematical, that is probably not equally a third, right? But if this is truly a third, then this should be 30 degrees. <laughs> Look at that. This is my 30 degree mark. And this is what I had marked. So, oops, sorry, I'm a little off. So yeah, no, actually it is 30 because I'm off here a little bit, but this is your 30. So that's one way to get 30 degrees. Okay, taking that and dividing it in thirds and your third week three. So that's his way of doing it. My way of doing it is going to require you to do your stairs. So you're going to do stairs that are exactly a square. So if you do a square like that, go all the way across, line it up like so. And you want to be as exact as possible. Oops. I'm going to go like this. And do this. Okay. And you're going to then take your line and you're going to go across here. Okay. And then you're going to divide this in half, going like this. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to create your nib width going this way. So if you do it this way, one, all right, and then you draw a line going here. Oops, that's off. That way. Two. Now this, Rob told me to tell you, is approximate. This is not going to be exact, but this is for those of you who don't have a protractor or compass to be able to use to measure with. If you look at that, and you go here, and this is your line, okay, and you line up, you will then approximately have 40 degrees, which is what you had drawn here. You have 30 degrees coming out here, and then this one is going to be closer to 20. So this is going to be 30 and this is going to be 20. Now this is going to be more exact, and this is going to be more approximate. But that's it, so that's my trick. Thank you, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna take a bow. <laughs> but that's it for now. So now we're going to work on the letter I and the letter O, because I want to make sure that we address those before we sign off. Let me grab my line paper real quick. Okay. So let's get to the parallel pen. Um, when you work with a parallel pen or a broad edge nib of any kind, you want to always make sure that you get what I call a running start. So more often than not, you will see someone do this when they write. You get a running start. So this ensures that you're, you are inked up at about 30 degrees. And for the letter I, what we're going to do is you're going to pull the nib up from below the, the line, come up as you're pulling to the right, and then pull straight down, and then turn to the right just slightly so you do that. <clears throat> what you're essentially doing is creating a little space here and a little space there, like that, okay? So what that looks like, what I call the skeletal structure of a letter, I like to do this, so you can see what I'm doing. So you're gonna come down, and as you come here, you're gonna come up, like that. So again, you have this space here, and you have this space here. I'm going to show you one other way that you will see unchills done. It's a different kind of serif where you do something similar, but it's a little bit more angular up on top, coming down, 
and you may see it come to a stop like this. And then what you do from here is you're going to take your nib from here and you're going to draw like that. And that is another type of serif that you can do, okay? <clears throat> and that is without pen manipulation. When you hear the word pen manipulation, you're actually twisting. You're going to be twisting from here to get from here to here, like this, okay? But you won't see this particular um, serif in Unchul. It is much more, it's, it's a little more hooked. We call it a hooked serif, okay? So there's that one letter form. And the other letter form that you, I would like for you to learn uh, when you take your class with me when you first start is the letter O. So the letter O is based on a circle. And what you do is you're going to start, I like to do this, cut the top line in half like that, and start right below, to the, off to the left, below that mark, and you're going to come down at an arc and make a half moon. So you're going to come down, turn your pen as you come to the baseline, and then stop. And then you're going to start about one pen nib width in from the top of where you started, right about there. You're going to pull out and then churn, come around and connect like that. Okay. Jane, you have 10 minutes. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll just work on this for a couple more minutes and then we'll address questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. So what that skeletal frame looks like is you're going to start about here. Okay. And then you're going to start pulling to the left, and as you get right to about the halfway mark, you're going to start canting to the right. Oops, I got a little wobbly there, my bad. And then you're going to touch the bottom and then come up like so. And the top is going to start about pen width nib in from where you started from, and you're going to pull out, come around and stop and connect, all right? Another way to be able to do this, hold on one second, <clears throat> is to draw a circle if it helps. Now, I did say that the letter O is based on the circle. The, the truth is that it really isn't. Um, it's a little bit more uh, oval in shape, but not quite an oval. And it is not quite exactly a circle as well. So if you were to draw a circle, what I do is I, because we're going to be doing within that frame right there, you can draw kind of like a circle. I like, I like to just kind of start around here and I'll kind of do sort of like a semi, like an O-ish shape maybe a little rounder on the outside like this. And just, there we go, like that. And what I do is I take my tip of my nib, I'm going to start at about there, okay? And I'm gonna start at my 30 degrees, come and keep the, this part of the, the O on the outside of my, the right side of my nib. So I'm kind of like tracing around that O that I drew and then come in and go under, so you're just coming under that O. Then you're gonna come in, maybe remember right here about one pen width in from where you started, and then go out. And this time, the O that you trace is going to be on the left-hand side of your nib. So you're gonna come up and around, trace, and you might have to come in a little bit, and then go in like that, okay? So if you were to not trace, you probably wouldn't be exactly that. You're going to find then that that O, that circular um, O in here, is going to not be so O-ish or oval. It's going to be canted a little bit depending on um, how you write. Oh, and speaking of writing, I need to also address Takako um, how to sit at the table. I forgot to do that. Actually, I should do that right now. So my work surface is exactly straight directly in front of me. My, my, my whole body is um, perpendicular to my table, okay? And my paper is directly in front of me. 
and my pen is not at an, my paper is not an angle. Okay, so if I were to angle it for copper plate or in grocer script or Spencerian, I would be at about maybe here. So I am exactly flush straight to the table, straight to my body. And my hand is directly in front of me and I am not using a slant board. So if you were to draw that, oh, one more time real quick. Coming up down and around, touch the bottom and stop. Staying at the 30 degrees, you're going to pick up your pen, drop in one pen nib width or so, in, pull out, come out, come around, and close, like so. And that's it, that is your O. So those are the two that um, is good to practice before taking my class. And I am available for questions. You just have to DM me over at Instagram if there is something that you, you need from me. Um, aside from that, I will probably send out uh, a message on it. I'll post the, the, the first session uh, or the introduction to the course uh, on Instagram, like I did for this one. And I really do appreciate your time um, and, uh, participation so so thank you so Takako let's go ahead and open up to questions and let's go ahead and do gallery view here okay let's do gallery view and um let's see I have a three questions Jane yes go for it um one of that which is would you would you explain the paper to um, positioning for left-handed people? Ah, yes, um, that is a very good question. Um, the positioning for left-handed people, um, I believe, should be the same if you are working at a 30 degrees, I might be wrong about that, hold on one second. That's a good question. I'm gonna to have to get back to you about that one. Can I get back to you? Who asked me that question? Um, that yeah. was Guinea, Guinea Huddle. I wrote it down. You did, okay. So um, is it Ginny or G Ellis? It's G. G, Ginny, I think, right? Ginny, are you here? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Hi, I, it's Ginny. I'm Ginny. Yeah, I'm Ginny. Ginny. How are you? Like a bottle of gin. <laughs> yes, Ginny. So Ginny, that's a really good question. Thank you. And I would like to be able to address it correctly. Mm -hmm. So let me get in touch with a left-handed um, broad edge calligrapher that I know. And I'm going to um, have that person instruct me or contact you, one or the other. Very good. Thank okay? you. Okay. All right. And if there are any other left-handed calligraphers here, if you could message um, Takako right now, send her a, a mess, private message in chat and give her your um, name um, and how I can contact you, preferably on Instagram, maybe in a group chat, that would be great. Also from Ginny, yes. um, will we able to watch this class again? Uh, this one is being recorded, but I'm not sharing it. This is a one-time thing. It's just to, um, well, you know what? That's okay. I'm going to make an exception. So I need to practice saving my video. I'm going to try and get this recording out to all of you using the email that you provided, Zoom, if that's okay with your permission. And I will email everybody a uh, video of this. It is only going to be available for, let's say, 30 days. But after that, I'm going to have to take it down because uh, it goes up in my cloud and it takes up a lot of space. So uh, let me go ahead and give that a try. I can't promise that it's going to work, but I will do my very best to get it out to you, Jenny. And <laughs> last question would be, how do you keep the ink flow consistent so it doesn't pull at the end? Um, pull, pull at the end? like um, So it doesn't just, make the puddle at the end? of the stroke? So, okay, who asked me that question? Can you unmute yourself? Amy. Amy. Yes, hi. Hi, Amy. 
How are you? I'm doing well. It's so nice to see you on here. Thank you for joining. Thank you. This is amazing. And, and I, I just love the way you were able to take us through very um, essential things to create a foundation for better practice. So oh, really I'm so glad. Yeah, it was terrific. I, I wonder though, as for example, at the beginning and the end of the I, at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you make the O with two strokes, mm -hmm. at each side, at each end, the ink pools. Yes. And so is there, is there a technique or is it just that's the way it is? And it's the paper that, so it's going to be the paper that you use. Uh, watercolor paper will probably um, be uh, allow it to be more wet, so you can use a lot more ink, and it's not going to puddle quite as much. Uh, or what, so no, let me take a step back. So the puddling is a feature that actually um, that uh, calligraphers really like because you can really utilize that puddling to do like you know color blending and uh, different techniques. So for example, I love using Winsor Newton calligraphy inks. Um, that I have watered down to various uh, gradations of colors so that I can transition from one color to another. And when my nib touches um, the edge of another letter form or within each letter form, like, you know, when it puddles, it actually kind of bleeds and feathers out and creates this beautiful gradation of color. So it's actually a desired aspect of writing. Um, now, if you don't want that, I, then I would suggest use a paper that doesn't dry quite as fast as this 25% cotton practice paper that I'm using. Um, if you use a uh, workable surface, like a watercolor paper, then what happens is you can really load up your nib or really load up that letter form. And I can show that to you right now really quickly. Takako, how are you doing on time? We are a minute over right now. Okay, so Takako, so everyone, Takako needs to run, but I can stay on. So for those of you who want to stay on and see what I'm talking about, please feel free to stay on. We are at the one hour mark. I know I promised you only one hour of my time, or your time, I should say. So feel free to leave at this point. But Takako, I wanted to say thank you so much for being a wonderful moderator. I really do appreciate your time. And if everyone can give Takako a quick wave and a, some love, that would be great. <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And Jane, I will email you with all the questions I've received. Sounds and then good. And then uh, audience IG. Perfect. Okay. Thank Thanks you so everyone. much. Everyone. Thank you. See you. Yay, Takako. Okay, let me admit this person, whoever that is. They're late to the game. <laughs> <laughs> they might be in a different time zone. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight my um, my screen real quick. Hold on one second here. Okay. So here is my screen. I have a small piece of um, watercolor paper right here to work on. And let me just get rid of that hurting. Okay, so here, let's say I want to, I'm gonna work with a bottle of water, um, walnut ink, just so I can really get it moist. All right, so, whoops, whoopsie daisy. <laughs> All right, so uh, the let's do the letter, let me zoom out just a little bit real quick. All right, so let's do the letter I, all right? So I'm using, if you wanted to know, I'm just using the Le Legion Stonehenge code press. It's code press paper, nothing fancy. Um, so let's do the letter I. So I'm going to write the letter I. And as I do it, you can see that it stays wet. I'm going to zoom in here. Actually, zooming out might be able to see the wetness better. See? It stays more wet on the paper right, than on regular scratch paper or practice paper, for example. Now I can go in and re-wet this, like so, so that it's really wet. And it's not gonna go anywhere because it's gonna stay within the confines of the letter form that I just wrote. And then to do that serif where I just kind of drag in and pull, I just do that. And it just floods and it'll match. And if you really don't like that, you can just tilt it like so so that the ink spreads evenly, and then you don't have that, where is the light, there it is. You don't have that puddling, 
Amy, does that help? I'll, I can do the same with the O for you. I think that that's very helpful. I didn't realize it, it was so dependent on the paper. Do you have a recommendation for, for the beginner? Is there a certain kind of paper that you would suggest we use? I think I might have uh, skipped that part. Maybe. Um, yes, yeah, so I had mentioned the Gilbert Bond 25%. 25. Um, okay. Yeah, so there's that. And then the other thing that you can also do is take a different color. So for example, I'm gonna do the Midori Sour. I'm just gonna wipe this excess off here and just dip it in. I didn't really mix the ink up, but I can drop this, hold on. I can drop a different color into the tips. Mm -hmm. It would help if I shake, shook. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's amazing and beautiful and it gives us so much to look forward to as we develop our own technique. How right. do you, when you dip into, so you use that same pen from the walnut ink and you, you wiped it off and then you dipped into the Midori, right? So how do you keep the inks themselves, because obviously you use it over a long period of time, how do you keep them fresh from becoming uh, stained with other colors? Or is it just inevitable? Well, what's amazing about the parallel pen is that the ink is contained mm -hmm. within the barrel. So right. there's no leaking out. All I do if I want to dip into another color is just wipe the tip off like this, like so, and just dip. And you can see that it hasn't, the walnut ink doesn't go into my ink here. Right. And is that true with the other pen as well? Um, no. With the other, the, yes, it is. But you won't be able to get, um, you have to clean the whole thing out. So if I were to dip it in here, I wouldn't be able to dip this. Right. keeping the, the brown ink in here to be able to do a blend. I would have to blend separately and add the ink. Okay. Separate, like so, by just touching the tip of my nib in to wet ink. Does that make, make sense? So yeah. because this is an open reservoir, this whatever is sitting in this reservoir is going to automatically go into my dinky dip. If I were to put this in here, I would get one of the ink here. And then do you see all that? Do you see the ink sitting in there? I do. Yeah, do you that's that what happens. Or you just... Oh, no, I just mix it in. It's, I mean, that's why it's a dinky dip. I mean, I'm, you know, in the whole scheme of things, this is just a very little bit of ink that I'm using. And I don't really fill the dinky dip all the way. I did for today in case I ran out, but. Oh, I, I don't think I understood that. So that's just a separate little, little uh, jar that you can fill with a certain amount of ink that you're going to use for that moment or, or piece or what have you. Exactly. Okay. That's great. Yeah. This is amazing. And I'm so grateful to you. So it's, Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you and, and for all the other things that you'll be offering. You are welcome. Is there anybody else with questions? I'm going to gallery view, so you should be able to see each other. Bernice, is that your son? She's frozen. Yes, he is. Wow. <laughs> wonderful and Bernice this is the first time I get to see you like see you see you <laughs> so you know friends I've been um doing a lot of zoom hangouts like we're a, a bunch of friends and I we we calligraphers we just get together and we just chat so if any of you ever want to do that hit me up on Instagram you know I'd love to see your face and just because I'm I'm uh, sheltered uh, I've been sheltered in place since March and I go out for groceries maybe once or twice a week at most and that that's just to get basic necessities and then come back home because my health is um is is not uh i, I just can't afford to get sick so yeah. it's just the boys and Same me the here. boys get to see their dad but yeah so this is the only Same way here. i get to interact you know with all of you yeah. <laughs> i know same situation over you so I can't see the chat box right now. I, I guess I can look over here. Does anyone else have any other questions that you'd like me to address before we go? Or maybe something for Supply Sunday tomorrow pertaining to what you learned here today. So I know that you wanted me to look into the, um, the cleaning the acrylic off of your parallel pen and uh, left-handed calligrapher. So that's the other thing I have down. Anything else? You can unmute yourself if you would like. If it's easier. You are all so good and quiet. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, um, last call for questions.
Are we good? All right. Hmm? I think that's it. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and say that it's been a pleasure having you here. I hope that um, you learned something new. And uh, if you didn't, <laughs> please message me and let me know that you'd like, if there's something else that you'd like to learn about as far as Anchol is concerned, something you'd like to see covered in the class coming up. Um, and uh, I will get that um, recording out to you soon, hopefully. And if I can't, I do apologize very much. <laughs> you know how technology can be, so. Okay, oh, you're welcome. Yes, for those of you getting ready to go to sleep, sleep well, happy dreams. And for those of you who are just starting your day or in the middle of your day, I hope the rest of your day is wonderful. And I will see you all tomorrow for Supply Sunday. And uh, thank you everyone for all of your support. It means a great deal to me. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.